to kick off now. Thank you very much for, for coming. Welcome to the power of 3D in cultural heritage management uh, presented by the Scottish group of the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists. Uh, my name is Matt Ritchie. Um, I'm your host for this evening, uh, the archaeologist for uh, Forestry and Land Scotland. Um, I was instructed to give a few minutes for other folk to join, but I firmly believe that they're just late. So uh, we'll crack on. Um, I'm really pleased to be chairing this session uh, and to be associated with such a fine lineup. Uh, I'm excited to hear uh, what they have to say and see what they have to present. We've got five presentations for you, uh, each about 20 minutes in length, uh, followed by a discussion. Um, you can type your comments uh, or questions into the comment box uh, and we'll aim to answer maybe one or two directly after each session and save some, save some for the discussion later. You'll be muted throughout uh, the presentations uh, which are being recorded, uh, but not the questions of the discussion. Um, so keep your spoken questions uh, till the end uh, when you can raise a virtual hand uh, by clicking the raise hand button. So as a cultural heritage resource manager, I use the products of archaeological measured survey uh, to demonstrate and evidence uh, value and significance. From the visibly impressive aspect of surveyors in their flash jackets on site with their cameras, drones and tripods, to the resulting impressive visuals of point clouds, interactive models and detailed site records, they all help tell a story of our upstanding um, archaeological cultural heritage. So I've always really been interested in archaeological survey, in visualisation and in, in, and in illustration. And in recent years, I've noticed a subtle gear change in the way we use 3D data. So our speakers today are all innovators driving forward this digital transformation. They innovate to create uh, using the developing technology to present our cultural heritage in new and interesting ways. So we have a lineup from, from across Scottish cultural heritage sector, from Historic Environment Scotland's digital documentation team. Uh, Dr. Lynn Wilson will be speaking on Beyond the Point Clouds, real world use of 3D digital data for conservation of heritage sites. Dr. Graham Cavers from AOC Archaeology will be talking about the 3D visualization of aerial LIDAR data uh, uh, using case studies and applications from Scotland. David Connolly of Skyscape Survey uh, will follow up using airborne photogrammetric survey, uh, explaining how he creates detailed contour models from a drone-based photogrammetric survey. Dr. Wukash Banashek uh, from the Historic Environment Scotland's survey and record team uh, will be looking at field observation, 3D modeling, and the enhancement of illustrative techniques. And Dr. Hugo Anderson Weimark from the National Museum of Scotland will talk about capturing the moment using photogrammetry for public engagement on archaeological excavations and his work uh, driving forward the use of Sketchfab in archaeology. So we have a, a, a wide range of techniques. Uh, I've asked all the speakers to focus on that on the product rather than the, the technical detail. Um, although I think we'll be it'll be interesting to see the blend of the, of the two, um, and I, I'm really looking forward to this. So um, I'll not hold up proceedings any longer. Please type your comments and questions into the comment box, and I'll I'll try and pick them up as we go as we go along. Uh, and so first up is Dr. Lynn Wilson from Historic Environment Scotland's digital documentation team. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you, Matt. Um, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and really looking forward to this session. Um, I'm on quite a, a rural broadband connection here, so I'm going to turn off my video before I, I share my screen with you um, and hopefully that'll help you see the presentation a bit more smoothly. Um, talking today about beyond the point clouds, how we use 3D data in Historic Environment Scotland for conservation of heritage sites. 
I'm currently Head of Programme for Technical Research and Science in our Digital Documentation and Innovation team um, within uh, the Conservation Directorate at, at Historic Environment Scotland. And I just thought I'd start off with, with an image from Achna Breck um, in the Kilmartin area, which we laser scanned as part of our um, re-project program to digitally document all of the, the properties that we look after um, within Historic Environment Scotland. So as most of you will probably be aware, we're the lead public body for Scotland's historic environment. And we look after a range of properties on behalf of the people of Scotland, um, ranging from archaeological sites, um, everything up to Edinburgh Castle and everything in between. So digital documentation, what, what do we mean by that within HES? It means different things to different people. But what we mean is a scientific approach to digitally record objects, sites, structures and landscapes in their present condition in 3D. And this has the potential to create huge multi-layered data sets, such as the point cloud that you can see here of Stirling Castle. And this has multiple uses and applications. We've been active in this area since 2001. And this is really at the heart of, of the digital activities that we do within our area of Historic Environment Scotland. We use a range of different digital documentation technologies. All are rapid, non-contact and non-destructive. At the heart of this is terrestrial, mobile and aerial laser scanning, but also structured light scanning and structure from motion photogrammetry, both terrestrial and UAV. And then we use total stations and multi stations and GNSS equipment as well to, to give us good survey control. Now, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about 4D digital documentation as well. And by that, what I mean is capturing 3D data over two or more meaningful periods of time to create a 4D data set which produces quantitative comparative measurements, which can be used to help us identify structural movement in, in buildings and erosion of archeological sites. And we're using these approaches to monitor condition at several places now. And I'm going to give you two examples of, of where we are doing that. So first of all, um, I'm going to give you some um, information about the case study at Scarabree where we're looking to measure change. Um, and this is one of three case studies that I'm going to talk about today. Scarabri, as I'm sure you're all aware, is part of the Heart of Neolithic Orkney World Heritage Site um, and just a fantastic place to be. It's incredibly close to the coastline now, um, as you can see from this aerial image. And we have sea defences, which, which are um, historic Scotland predecessors built there many years ago to protect the village itself. But we still have a lot of issues here with um, erosion of the soft landscape material um, at either side of the village. The site at Scarabri here and the wider historic um, World Heritage Site in Orkney was subject to a process called Climate Vulnerability Index, which was a new methodology to rapidly assess climate impacts. Um, and this was the first application on a cultural World Heritage property was undertaken in Neolithic Orkney in 2019. And the work that we do feeds into both the CVI process and to the management plan um, for the World Heritage Site here. So what do we do then? We undertake laser scanning and UAV photography to create a, a 3D data set of the coastline here, building from a baseline that we started in 2010. We go back every two years from that baseline from 2010 and we carry out a comparison from that baseline to give us a quantitative measurement of how much change is happening at Scarabri. As I said, it's every two years, but that would mean we should then go for 2020, but clearly 
nobody was undertaking field work in 2020, largely. So we have just actually come back from a 2021 epoch of this data collection. And this is a very preliminary result that I'm showing you here today, comparing between 2010 and 2021. And what you can see here in red are areas of erosion of the soft landscaping. And where you can see green, this is areas of accretion or tidal action. What we find is that it's a very complex picture and a very dynamic picture that we see here. But this data is, is then shared with our conservation architects and also with um, researchers who are leading on um, the Dynamic Coast project. Dynamic Coast is a Scottish government-led initiative to examine Scotland's coastal change. And they are working with um, researchers at Glasgow University and um, our colleague Ali Rennie um, from Scottish, from, sorry, from Nature Scott, as they're called now, leads the, the programme. Um, and we sit on the steering committee for this as well. So we look at historical data with them and we overlay our 3D data onto the, the 3D models to show that change. And what that's showing is that we are having a progressive um, rate of loss of soft landscaping out with the coastal defences. Um, and this is um, a progressive and complex situation. But this is helping us to understand better what is going on here and to then use this information to help in conservation decision-making processes for this a really important site. So this is something that we will continue with um, on a two yearly basis and to feed this information to the managers who are making these decisions about what we do to make sure that we can preserve this, this really important site. A second example of this um, technique using 4D digital documentation is from the Glasgow School of Arts Macintosh building, where we measured structural movement following the fire um, back in 2014. So again, you'll all be, I'm sure, familiar with with the building and with the library within the Macintosh School as it once was. And the fateful day in, in May 2014 when fire took hold. This was the library the day after the fire. And we were able to, to get access to the fire damaged building the day after under the um, the the guidance and the um, direction of the fire um, safety officers that we were working with. And what we did was we laser scanned as much as was safe to do in the immediate aftermath of the fire. So we were able to, to capture the external facades of the building and also um, a significant proportion of the interior of the building at that point. And luckily there was previous data, which our colleagues at Glasgow School of Art had captured as a student project from 2008. So using that, we were able to carry out a similar quantitative comparison to that which we did at, at Scarabree. So in the immediate aftermath of the fire, the building control services team were very worried about the facade that you can see on the screen here. And there was um, much discussion about whether or not this should just be completely knocked down. And obviously this is, this is a, you know, incredibly important building for in terms of Scottish architectural heritage and one which we wanted to preserve as much as possible at that time. So what we did was we focused on this facade and the uppermost um, part of that um, gable end. And we were able then to use these previous scans to carry out this comparative measurement of pre and post fire to analyze how much movement there had been in this gable. So zooming in on the, on the top part, we were actually able to quantify on a stone by stone basis how much movement there had been. 
the red um, boxes that you can see there represent stones that had moved more than two centimetres, with orange and green being less than that. So a decision was made in discussion between Historic Environment Scotland and the building control team to then remove just the uppermost part of this gable rather than take down the whole facade. And what we also were able to um, help with the decision making process was that instead of just going in with um, you know, a, a, a wrecking ball effectively, this part of the gable would be removed on a stone by stone basis using the data from the laser scan. So what we did was we went back to 2D CAD from the laser scan and individually marked up each stone. And one of our stonemasons then went up in a cherry picker and physically transferred those annotations onto the individual stones. And they were then removed one by one and safely stored. At the same time, we also used the 3D data to engage with the community at the art school and to stimulate creative response. So we used the imagery from the, the laser scans, which were in some cases quite beautiful, quite evocative, quite thought provoking to to host an exhibition in the in the, the Glasgow School of Art um, back in 2016. Um, and that really was a bit of a catalyst for for a lot of discussion. The you know it was obviously a very emotive time for the students and the staff at Glasgow School of Art who couldn't access the building directly. Um, so being able to look um, at the imagery from the laser scans and to be able to understand a little bit more about what was happening in the building that they couldn't access. We found um, and we had feedback that this was, you know, a really positive way to, to engage and to understand a little bit more about what was happening. So it, in a disaster situation, this was a, a useful technique to, to help to understand not only the, the conservation issues facing the building, but also to help with engagement as well. And obviously, sadly, um, there has since been the second devastating fire, um, and we can only wait to see what is going to happen to the Macintosh building next. Moving on to my last case study, I just want to um, illustrate some examples of how 3D data innovations are supporting traditional conservation skills. And this is another big area which we, we work in and focus on um, within the Conservation Directorate. Um, and we have um, a large cohort of stonemasons who, who are going through a training process with us. So with a couple of different buildings, one within our own estate at Duff House up in Banffshire, and one within um, a partner um, team at the Office of Public Works in Ireland, the, the Four Courts building in Dublin, we've been working on a programme to digitally document them, and in particular, some capitals which are on both of those buildings. So this is my colleague, Adam Frost, um, digitally documenting uh, one of the capitals at Duff House with an Arctic Leo structured light scanner. And from that, he produced not only the 3D models, but also these 2D visuals directly from the, the scan data. And what we've been doing with that is then to, to create 3D models, which our stonemasons can view in, in a VR environment. So we have Oculus Quest and we have Vive headsets and our stonemasons use these headsets while they are recarving capitals which will go into these buildings in place of um, capitals which are badly in need of repair. They're beyond um, stabilization and need complete replacement. So we, we use these 3D models in that context to support training. And our stonemasons have fed back that this is, 
you know, this is something completely new to them, um, but they're really enjoying using this um, different method of um, template effectively. We also then use our large format 3D printers to 3D print elements of these capitals. You can see that process um, going on here. So our stonemasons have a comparison with both the 3D printed version, which um, you can see um, my colleague Al Rawlinson, who's our head of digital innovation, um, and our stonemason Lara um, on the right here, um, with a part of the, the capital that she's been recarving based on both the 3D printed template and the VR version. And this is one of the, the finished capitals, um, which is uh, part of a partnership project, as I mentioned, with the um, Four Courts building in, in Dublin. So this has been carved by our stonemasons in, in Orkney, actually, um, and is now going to be transferred over to, to Dublin to go into this building as part of a, um, a collaborative conservation project. And again, this has been um, carved not using traditional um, templates, but with the VR uh, version of the the original and with the um, the three D printed versions. And then finally, I just want to, to to show you something we're working on at the moment within Historic Environment Scotland, where we're trying to really normalise the use of three D data within um, our architect departments and and with other professionals and within his who who would have benefit from using 3d data as i've mentioned we're capturing information for all of the monuments and sites and also our collections that we look after so we're quickly generating um, a, a big 3d resource um, of information and we want that to be as useful as possible within conservation and other aspects of of historic um, environment management so we're rolling out access to um, our 3d data using poetry which some of you might be familiar with it's an open source software package but it lets you quickly share large data sets such as this is Carnassery Castle that I'm showing you here in Argyll. Um, and these then are methods that, that would, do not reply, require expert use from 3D modeling specialists. This is with a, a simple readme file and a simple video tutorial. Our architects who are not au fait in 3D technologies are going to be able to use this data to quickly take measurements, to do inspections, any other uses for, for conservation or other heritage management. Within HES, we're um, rolling out a properties and care asset management system. And within that system, for each of our properties and care, we're going to have our 3D models linked. Currently, we just have our Sketchfab models. Um, but that will, will roll out then to, to these poetry 3D models, which are really interactive and people can, as you can see from the last slide, take measurements and get a lot of information and, and high level detail from. So hopefully that's given you a quick overview of, of how we use 3D data and 4D data to let us monitor change and structural movement um, in the support of conservation decision making. There are real tangible benefits for using 4D data in disaster response situations in our experience. We're using 3D data in innovative ways to support traditional conservation skills such as stonemasonry. And these collaborative digital resources, we hope are going to be able to help us better manage and conserve our heritage assets going forward, as well as improving engagement and accessibility. So that's all from me. Um, if any of this is of any interest, um, we do have a free guide um, that you're welcome to download using the, the QR code that you can see there. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Lynn. That was 
fantastic. Uh, I'm a massive fan of what you guys are doing at the Digital Documentation Centre. Um, I think there's there's real visible trickle down from the, the cutting edge stuff that you do at such scale uh, into the wider sector. And it's uh, it's, oh, it's, it's tremendous to, to, to look at. I, I had one quick question for myself, which was the, uh, the, 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 the condition monitoring or the erosion monitoring at Scarrow Bray, does that rely on uh, really high tech fixed points that you can you can keep going back to that, that you know that are not going to move so you can you kind of hook your data sets onto yes matt sorry i should have mentioned that as i was talking yeah we have permanent survey markers um embedded at set points within the landscape both within the site and within the wider um b at scale um, just at Scarabri. So yeah, these are absolutely essential to let us have really accurate measurement over and over again. Um, but th this is always a challenge, particularly with coastal um, erosion. Um, we have these markers that we installed back in 2010, but when we went back in, in just August this year, two of those markers have actually gone. So we're, we have lost two in that time period. So luckily we have, we have enough there that we can still tie in and give us that really accurate comparison. But, but that is something that's, that's always going to be a challenge is maintaining the integrity of these, these survey points over time in, in erosion situations, but really important. Yeah. Brilliant. I, th I thought the, um, the comparison between the long-term monitoring you're doing at Scarrow Bray and that rapid response at the, the Glasgow School of Art was was fascinating as well. It must have been a quite an experience going in there to uh, to record. But uh, it was it was how did you get that? How did you get that access? I mean, it was there the, uh, high-level discussions, and were they were they quite amenable to you coming in to do that? Yeah, well, we've had a long-standing partnership with the Glasgow School of Art, so we've we've worked with them regularly over over the last 13, 14 years. So when the fire happened, yeah, those high-level discussions happened very quickly um, to facilitate access literally the day after the fire. Um, and and we facilitated the the salvage operation. Um, within that first phase of the fire so it was yeah a very emotive experience um for us all who were involved in it um but yeah. in that in that short term we were just pleased we could do anything we could to help the situation yep we have one final question from the chat bar, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, saying very good talk, very, very interesting. Um, this is from Dave, your, your fellow, David, your fellow uh, presentee. Um, he's been loving the Edinburgh Castle model, which I, he stimulated me to go and have a look at as well. It is brilliant. Uh, will you be going inside as well? And indeed, will you be able to knit the two together? Yes, very much so. Yeah, that is that is part of the Ray project. So we definitely um, document interiors and exteriors now. Um, as you can imagine, for somewhere like Edinburgh Castle, that generates a massive data set. Um, so it's trying to balance out how you can um, successfully present that information um, uh, with maintaining um, the, the accuracy of the model. Um, so yeah, it's um, it kind of tests the power of our computing workstations quite a lot um, and we then obviously have to be really careful with how we disseminate that to to share that on platforms like Sketchfab um, we obviously have to optimize that quite extensively um, but it's you know as um, software packages are are um, rapidly moving forward as we'll hear in in some of our later talks it's becoming slightly easier to do that um, even with large data sets like that Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, right, you. we will be moving on now to uh, Dr. Graham Cavers of AOC Archaeology. Uh, 3D visualization of aerial LIDAR data. Over to you, Graham. Um, good. Yep. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, I'm here yeah, to talk um, about some new directions that we at AOC have been taking um, the visualization of uh, aerial laser scanning LIDAR data in um, over the past few years and just to really talk about some um, new directions that we're, uh, we see that this stuff uh, going in and also some sort of different um, standards that we can expect to make use of in, in the profession going forward. So my talk is uh, 
not so much. I guess it's maybe um, maybe a bit grand to talk about this in terms of innovation, because as as Lynn says, three um, D data is becoming much more normal, much more widespread in in the use uh, in its use in our profession generally. So. Um, this is more about uh, pointing to new directions, new ways of using the data that more and more people are familiar with and using on a daily basis. And then, okay, let me, so, okay. so as everyone here, I'm sure is probably aware, um, LiDAR data is becoming more and more ubiquitous. You know, there's um, certainly in Scotland, we're very fortunate to have this uh, data set uh, available via the Scottish Remote Sensing Portal, um, but also there's the equivalent um, environment agency uh, south of the border. Um, so the, the availability of LiDAR data is much greater than it, it, it ever has been. And um, this resource is just a fantastic, uh, you know, um, data set for archaeologists from, from all uh, angles of the profession, but particularly in, in topographic survey um, prospection uh, and quantification and management of archaeological sites as well. So obviously you can get onto this uh, uh, website you can download the data freely anyone's uh, is free to um, to do that and can download it in a variety of formats and and so i'm sure as most people attending this session are, are aware um, this gives you a really sort of powerful uh, resource at your fingertips but the one thing that i sort of the aspect of it that i want to concentrate on today is the fact that this data is 3d and um, it's very easy to to treat this as mapping data and focus on the, the sort of, um, almost more traditional 2d um, products that come from it and i all i want to do uh, in my contribution today is to kind of point to um, the the value of the three-dimensional aspect of it um, it's also important to emphasize that the data that you can get from the remote sensing portal and from its equivalents elsewhere is is um is data that's been compiled for all sorts of purposes for for different reasons and not specifically for archaeology and um, so it's always worth looking at the source data and considering reprocessing it for for the application that you've got in mind um, and as i say uh, the thing i want to emphasize is that is that this is um, the three-dimensional data and the source point cloud um, that creates these data sets is always worth revisiting and going back to. So my talk's uh, really about um, the case for considering the 3D aspect of, of all of this stuff, of aerial laser scanning and LiDAR data. So I think most people working in archaeology these days are familiar with the products of LiDAR. We've all probably seen hill-shaded models um, and you know been impressed by the level of detail we can get from these things. Um, but I just want to uh, to draw attention to the fact that um, that all of this data is is easily reprocessable, and it's important to take into account um, both the source of the data, the source parameters that the data was uh, collected at, um, and also the application that you've got in in mind um, for the data. So I just want to um, uh, to make the point that. Because archaeology is 3D, at least all, all of the stuff that, um, that we can usefully look at using LiDAR, um, it's important to make the most of the 3D element of the, of the data set itself. And that leads us to sort of uh, to, to make a better use of things like topographic context and, and to make sense of the topographic logic of the archaeology that we're looking at and understand these sites much better in terms of where they're placed in the landscape um, and also the sort of nuances of the micro topography that we can detect on the ground. And the final point I want to make on this slide is that it's really important to emphasize that there's no one solution here that fits everything. And that's something that I'm sure everyone who works with 3D data will recognize is that there's no one approach to, um, to archaeological survey data that fits in every situation. So it's really important to engage with the, um, with the three dimensional aspect of this data, the source and um, point clouds that it comes from and ask yourself whether um, the products that you're looking at are suitable for, for what you've got in mind. I should probably say at this point as well that I am aware that um, what, when I say 3D in this talk, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about true 3D. Um, Lynn showed some really um, impressive examples of, of using 3D in a true immersive environment, but using systems like Oculus and that kind of thing. And what I'm talking about is, is the the two and a half D as it's almost as it's sometimes referred to the the the, the representation of three D data on a two D screen. On that note, um, again, it's it's important to uh, preface uh, everything I'll say by um, by pointing out that 
the treatment and analysis of 3D data is very much a device, you know, so this is a, a way of, of, of approaching the data and um, that conveys meaning. Okay, so that's, that's something that, that is very important to bear in mind in terms of the process of depiction um, as archaeologists do it. So that has a long history. Map makers have always uh, sought uh, suitable approaches to depicting things like terrain, slope, and gradients using a number of techniques. And that goes all the way back to some of our earliest maps. Um, this, this some, some of the best early examples were on Roy's map. You can see here, um, laterally, the, the Ordnance Survey uses contours. Um, and hashers have been the sort of traditional weapon of choice for archaeologists in terms of depicting slope. Um, but it's important to recognize that what that what things like hashers and contours to an extent do is to depict slope in the eyes of the surveyor. So it's an interpreted version of um, the terrain that the surveyor has been documenting. And one of the advantages that 3D data gives us is the this ability to, um, to almost step back from the interpreted part of it and produce um, different visualizations that allow us to ask new questions of the, the stuff we're surveying. So these are just some examples of some very traditional uh, style hill shades. So these are derived from, again, the Scottish government LIDAR data. Um, this is the sort of typical treatment, um, the most basic treatment that you would give a terrain, high resolution terrain model um, uh, deriving from LIDAR. So this is a single illumination um, hill shade, um, just uh, lit from one angle. And Without going into too many details, it's well recognised now that a single hill shade is, is very limited in its, um, uh, its utility for archaeologists, not least because um, if you light the same image from the other app from a different angle, you tend to get this inversion effect where the brain interprets the um, lumps and bumps as depressions instead of um, uh, upstanding remains. So um, that combined with the fact that single direction hill shades cast shadows and potentially obscuring archaeological features. These are quite limited in extent. And while they have their place uh, in interpreting terrain, it is important to recognize that, um, that any treatment of 3D data has its own limitations. So typically, the way we get around um, limitations like that is to use more advanced visualization techniques. So things like multi-directional hill shades, uh, things like local relief models <coughs> that accentuate um, minor changes in topography. Um, these things tend to do a much better job uh, accentuating uh, very small changes in, <clears throat> in elevation in models like this. Um, but again, um, the point I want to make here is that all of this, <coughs> excuse me, all of this is a reduction of 3D data down to, is a tr translation of the 3D data down to um, a visualization that is usable um, in, a, in a 2D format. So again, most of us who are familiar with 3D data, and particularly aerial laser scanning, will be aware of, of the typical um, modeling techniques and packages that get used for this purpose. Um, the most ubiquitous is the Relief Visualization Toolbox, which provides tools for things like multi-directional hill shading, um, slope analysis, sky view factor, that kind of thing. <clears throat> All useful treatments for terrain um, that can get around some of these limited or limitations in fixed visualizations that I've been talking about. But all of these are based on various sort of component tools that you can find in all Esri software, for example, and increasingly powerfully uh, in open source solutions as well, like QGIS. And many of you, again, will be familiar with um, the, these issues um, most comprehensively discussed in, in this volume that I've just put up on the screen here, <coughs> um, edited by Rachel Lopitz and Dave Cowley where a lot of the papers discuss the, the limitations and uh, the considerations that have to be taken into account when visualizing terrain. Um, and many of those papers talk about the, um, the standardization, the scientific visualization of, of 3D data and how we get away from this bias introduced by, um, by standard surveying techniques. Um, there's also the considerations of use, use of colour, um, uh, things like colour ramps and how they affect how we see terrain. Um, and all of this is pointing towards the idea of standardisation and that there should be a way to visualise terrain that gets away from um, the subjective element introduced by, by standard survey techniques. 
Now that's something that's this kind of source of a much bigger debate, um, not least that we've had amongst members of this group here today. Um, but I would also question uh, this idea of a standardized approach. As I mentioned before, there's no one size fits all solution to visualizing terrain. Um, and just an example of this is that even these out of the box solutions for visualizing terrain data, um, uh, even the relief visualization toolbox has many parameters that feed into it. Um, and it's important that anyone who works with 3D data and the visualization of 3D data is aware that the product that you get from any of these visualization techniques um, varies dramatically depending on the input parameters. So most people, uh, probably your average LiDAR user, will just uh, run data through standard processing technique, click go, uh, accept all the default input uh, parameters, and you'll get a good usable product from it. But it's important to be aware that uh, that is a product using the parameters you've selected and that you can get very different results and even push the um, the amount of information that comes out of these visualizations using different and uh, combined techniques. So how do we use this in 3D terms then? Um, well, what I, some of the examples that I just want to show you today um, that we've been working on make use of combining these uh, techniques of visualizing terrain so that um, so the analytical visualization techniques that are explored in, in Rachel and Dave's volume um, things like sky view factor and uh, local relief modeling um, and then the integration of those data sets with the 3D data itself. So this is an early example um, of Castle Law Hill for produced by by HES um, a good well uh, twelve or more years ago I think now um, where the traditional hazard survey is draped onto a terrain model um, and this is what this is doing is is merging two two different approaches two different devices for depicting slope. Um, and you can see that there's okay there's limitations in that approach but you can see how it enhances the appreciation of the upstanding elements of this site, um, albeit in still using a sort of traditional and, and subjective uh, means of doing so. But some of the ways we've been looking at merging uh, two and 3D data sets and visualizations is by making, the use, uh, making use of these analytical visualizations that we can get from the GIS toolkits that I've been describing um, and merging them with the 3D data sets to produce new and, uh, and improved um, visualizations. And so this is giving us sort of new tools for, um, for being uh, uh, critical and, um, and allowing us to ask new questions of data sets um, long after the, you know, the, the field visits may have taken place. So um, uh, this uh, using uh, techniques like hill shading, local relief modeling, and blended um, visualizations, and then applying them to the 3D data in a in a full scaled um, CAD environment allows us to to work with these um, data sets sort of interactively. Other advantages of working with these data sets together is that we're able to be much more critical and uh, you know uh, look at um, things that we suspect we see on the ground, and this is a um, a useful tool when uh, prospecting for new techniques. This is just an example of a of a new site uh, that came out of analysis of, of LiDAR data um, down in southwest Scotland um, near Newton Stewart, um, a new uh, earth rampart uh, fortification site um, that came out um, of LiDAR analysis. And again, just um, using the interactive tools that you're able to make use of um, in a 3D environment, uh, lighting directions, um, uh, moving the data around in 3D using different um, uh, colour treatments to accentuate slope and elevation um, really gives you a new sort of um, uh, aspect on, on asking questions of this sort of terrain. Other examples um, uh, that we've been looking at are, are where um, we've been able to um, accentuate elements of the data in, in terms of um, uh, enhancing uh, very slight features. So this is a, an example of a palisaded enclosure down your orchard rig near Peebles in the borders. Um, and the data um, that you're looking at here is, is giving us um, information on, on earth cut features, which are really only a few centimeters in depth. Um, so we're not talking about massively 3D data here. Um, this is uh, elevation changes uh, over sort of maximum 10, 20 centimeters. 
Um, so really making the most and actually pushing the limits of what's possible um, with the LiDAR data itself. And this is a quite a good example of a site where using the default parameters and the, the default pre-processed data that you might get from the remote sensing uh, portal would probably give you a much fuzzier and less clear result. Um, so it's worth reprocessing this data to accentuate some of the, um, the, the very slight changes in topography. And this again, this example just shows this is the site itself. You can see it's just on a typical um, Scottish Borders hillside, um, so sort of heather and um, and bracken uh, covering this area. So uh, really quite difficult to pick out the features clearly. Um, but again, working with this data in three D, making the most of sort of interactive lighting to um, to accentuate the features that we want to depict um, allows us to produce a you know a much better um, interpretation of that terrain. So this is just the model. The data itself um, derives straight from the, the um, from the source point cloud, and you can see just immediately working with this um, uh, version in three D allows us to pick out areas that. Um, we might want to focus on. You can see clearly the, the ring ditches within this palisaded enclosure. But moving on from that, um, it's it's possible to accentuate this uh, these very uh, small changes in terrain even further. And what this data set is doing, um, this version of the data set is doing, is effectively a 3D version of the, the local relief model that I talked about earlier um, in terms of 2D visualization. So effectively, the, the general trend in the underlying terrain, the hillside effectively has been compressed to a flat slope. And all we're, we're looking at in the, in the Z dimension here is the very micro topographic changes, the very small changes um, that uh, relate to archaeological features on the ground. And again, using an interactive um, uh, color ramp to de depict the, the terrain, we're able to sort of accentuate the depths in the blues here with the, the raised areas in red. And the other thing that working in 3D um, allows us to do is that by doing things like exaggerating the Z dimension, um, effectively stretching these micro topographic features up the way, and we're able to accentuate these very trace remains of these uh, timber structures, which as I say, are right at the limits of the capability of airborne laser scanning detection. And again, because we're working in a, in a scaled CAD environment, we're able to take measurements, that sort of thing, and ask quite new questions of the data dynamically. Another element um, which has a, a significant benefit in terms of working in 3D is, um, is the uh, combination of data sets. And this is just an example from a survey that we carried out recently on one of the raised beaches on the west coast of the Mackers down in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, so this area, the blue area in this image, um, is uh, close to the shore. The raised area is, is up on the raised beach where a lot of the area's archaeological sites are found. And what this little video is showing you is just um, data that we integrated with the 3D model and um, derived from high resolution cart based magnetometry. Um, so that's picking up um, the sub uh, surface uh, archaeology. So you can see in the grayscale image there um, the, the clear remains of the ditch um, of this uh, late prehistoric enclosure. And again, um, working with that dynamically um, with things like um, a, a color ramp that where you can adjust on the fly to accentuate again the very small changes in, in elevation between uh, the lowest and highest points of this site, we're able to work out you know, the extents of the very plowed down remains of this fort. Um, so again, just this, uh, this idea of working dynamically in 3D allows us to, you know, um, to ask new questions of the data um, uh, when they're all combined in this sort of unified environment. Another element that I'll point towards is, again, this is another example of integrating uh, uh, high resolution geophysics with, um, with LiDAR based terrain modelling. Um, but it's a useful way of interpreting um, where landscape elements uh, fall in terms of uh, the, the relationship between those and uh, the, the geophysical data that we've collected. Um, so visualizing uh, things like geophysics data alongside this terrain modeling is becoming increasingly important. And um, we're all, I think, probably all used to seeing uh, geophysics data pre uh, presented in 2D. Um, but it's important to, to understand where features um, fall in relation to the terrain and um, where the data was collected. Um, and this is just an example from the Mull of Galloway down in the far southwest of uh, Dumfries and Galloway. 
Um, and this uh, video was used not only to help the archaeologists who did the survey to interpret the, uh, the results of that geophysical survey, um, but also to help um, present this data to uh, a non-specialist audience. So uh, making use of the 3D visualisation really helps to convey how this, um, this data translates into something that you know, your average um, uh, enthusiastic volunteer can understand. And this aspect of visualization is a really important um, uh, element of 3D data. And it's often a charge level that um, those of us who work with 3D data regularly, that we we always have the pretty pictures and, and that's maybe not a, a bad thing uh, on the whole, but it's, a, it's an important aspect of what we do um, with this data is, is being able to translate our, our interpretations and our, um, our analytical visualization into something that makes sense for the reader. Uh, so the presentation of the data is really important and that goes back to what I was saying at the start of my talk about how any treatment of 3D data is a device in the same way that the contour plan is a device and the same way that the hasher plan is a device. It's a way of communicating slope um, and, uh, and what you think that slope represents. Um, and this, these are just examples that I've worked on with Matt in terms of visualizing archaeology in forested environments. And that's a, that's a really effective tool for conveying um, how extensive that archaeology can be, even in these, in these planted areas. The other thing about uh, combining traditional and uh, three-dimensional approaches is that uh, often um, one of the most effective ways of communicating that is, is to combine these two things. So people are used to looking at hasher plans, they're used to looking at contour plans, and they're, they're, there's a tradition of using hashers uh, in archaeology for a reason, and it's because they're effective and they're good at communicating interpreted uh, archaeology. And I'm a big uh, exponent of, of making use of all of these things. So I think that hasher plans always have their place um, and are an important way of conveying uh, what the surveyor has seen on the ground. Um, and I'm very keen on, on uh, presentations of three-dimensional or two and a half D archaeology alongside traditional interpreted plans. And um, because I think that that's how you best convey um, both the landscape context of the site, but also the interpreted archaeology on the ground. And these are, again, just examples that, um, that Matt and I have worked together on um, in recent um, projects, um, where we have uh, sort of looked to, to present these traditional 2D um, hasher plans alongside the three-dimensional data, just to augment and enhance the interpretation of those sites. And the final point I just wanted to make was that, um, again, just overlapping with uh, what I suspect we'll hear a few times um, this afternoon, is that um, the sharing and uh, communication of data is a really important part of what we do. Um, and that's uh, an important element of working with 3D data, is getting it across to people in a way that, that people can interact with and understand. Um, and again, uh, Everybody uh, is making use of Sketchfab these days, quite rightly, because it's a, a, an ideal platform for, um, for disseminating um, three-dimensional data. Um, but just to make the point that this goes beyond just um, photogrammetric and um, artifact models, that we can make use of terrain models as well, um, and the sort of analytical treatments that we've, um, we've applied to those da uh, data sets. Uh, on platforms like Sketchfab. So it's a really effective way of getting across, um, you know, interpretation of, of archaeological sites. And we've done that on several projects in the past, um, including our recent work on the Witada project with Scottish Borders Council. So just to kind of uh, pull things together and wrap up then, I just uh, hopefully have made um, the case for 3D and, and um, for moving uh, beyond and alongside uh, traditional uh, two-dimensional visualization techniques for, um, for LiDAR data. And just to kind of emphasize that the, um, the importance of going back to the source data in, in three-dimensional data sets, um, particularly where they come from, um, you know, pre-processed downloadable data sets like you get on the remote sensing portal. Um, I would argue that there's there's always a loss of fidelity when we reduce the um, the three dimensional data sets down to two D, and that's why I think we need to be thinking in terms of, um, as Lynn said, I think this is a really important uh, point. Um, we should be thinking in terms of normalizing the use of three D. It should become standard that how archaeologists approach and present archaeological sites um, is to involve the use of 3D data and that we should become more and more comfortable with um, communicating and sharing data in 3D. 
Now, as always, that has implications for hardware and software. Not everything that I've shown you um, this afternoon, uh, like Lynn's presentation, not everything that you've seen can be produced on your average laptop. Some of it does require um, more powerful PCs, but this is increasingly becoming less of an issue. Um, more and more uh, data can be handled by your, your average computing software. And that, that, that goes for uh, both software and hardware. But I think the important thing that us as a profession need to think about is that you know the standardization of 3D skills um, should be something that, that we see um, as essential going forward. Um, we wouldn't have questioned the idea of being able to draw or survey in terms of um, archaeological training 10 years ago. We now need to be thinking about standardizing the, uh, the use of 3D and 3D data sets uh, in our profession going forward. And I think I'll stop there, Matt, with just a note of thanks to um, my colleagues in the Survey and Geomatics Department, AOC, who worked with this alongside, uh, alongside me on this, and um, of course to Matt, who sponsored a lot of this work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. Perfectly pitched as always. Uh, I love the idea of two and a half dimensions. I think that that's that's brilliant. I'm going to operate from now on in two and a half D because uh, it's the it's the visualization aspect that I uh, really gets me. Um, I do love the, the the initial stage of prospection, and I'm really interested in your the investigation element and particularly the the, the layering of data sets uh, with with geophysics. But it's the it's site based visualization that gets me and. I thought that what you are uh, you're implying that that you, you you perhaps do one level of reassessment of your your overall GI, um, lidar data set to do that prospection, and then when you found the areas or particular sites you want to you want to concentrate on, you would then revisualize or perhaps reprocess uh, to get that data. And I th I think that's uh, that's that's really really important because we all get comfy, don't we? And uh, um, our our favoured buttons or tools that, that, that we press for whatever reason that we're, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're doing. So uh, uh, yeah, don't get comfy. I think it was, yeah. a, it was a great. Uh... Yeah, I think that I think that is an important point that it's, you know, it's a process that you start off um, by prospecting almost even if you there's a site you know is there. Um, when you start looking at the 3D data, um, the, your initial treatment of it might, might not necessarily be the one that you end up with. Um, so it is a process of of kind of um, going back to the data and seeing what you can enhance to, to show the important features. Yeah, so yeah, it goes from the prospection stage through the analysis stage to the to the presentation stage, as you say. Yeah. And does will that have implications for the more sort of machine automated landscape scale um, lidar prospection that's that, that's that's been mentioned or worked on? Uh, if you if if the amount of level of of, of re reprocessing you had to do at the the the, the Cheviot's, um turf palisaded sites, uh, would that have been possible uh, at at a, at a landscape scale when you're just looking at one? Um, one yeah, sort think, of processing. I think that's it. And as I say, there's there's no one treatment that suits every archaeological site because it depends on local topography and you know local conditions. Um, I suspect that when uh, the automated processes that are being developed, um, you know, in the profession at the moment are are going to help us a lot with prospection and narrowing down the sites that you probably want to look at. Um, when it comes to the best treatment and visualization for an individual site, I think that will always be a case of processing the data a number of ways and seeing what works best. Um, so yeah, again, I think it's, it is an iterative process, you know, um, you can use automation to a point. Um, and I wouldn't want to imply, you know, that if you accept the default values out of any of these processing toolboxes that I've mentioned, that you're going to get a bad result. I mean, that's not the case at all. But the point, important point is that you can get more by going back and asking new questions of it and saying, and, and, OK, that doesn't fit here, so let's try something different. Yep. Brilliant. I'm, I've got a question from Jenny, uh, which is about geophysics, uh, overlaying geophysics on LIDAR. And Joel was wanting to ask a question. If I could keep them till the discussion, because uh, um, uh, yes, I'll keep both of those questions till for the discussion at the end. It's a really, really interesting uh, a question about um, putting um, overlying different data sets in a development context. So I'll, I'll leave, Graham, you have a think about that. And in the meantime, we'll move on to David, uh, who's talking about using airborne photogrammetric survey to create detailed contour models. Uh, over to you, sir. 
Um, I'm so glad that uh, Graham and Lynn went before me because they have actually basically explained everything um, in such a way that I actually don't have to say anything now. And so it's quite, it's just as well that I've actually decided to go on a slight segue. Um, so what, what I'm talking about is not quite what I said I would talk about, but however, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the ballpark. Um, I've got to thank you, by the way, uh, Mr. Inspiration himself, for inviting me to participate in this session. At first, I felt a little bit like a, a, an imposter. It's like, well, uh, am I an innovator? Um, but then I, I weirdly, um, I, we I went back and I discovered that uh, along with Kirkdale, I think we were about the first to, to use um, strange um, photo modeling technology in 1997. Unbelievably, and back when it was bloody difficult to do. Anyway, um, what is this presentation about? Art for tech's sake. And it kind of, uh, I'm not going to go into the technical aspects of it, really, because it's all been said, but it, it is uh, very much for what Graham's been saying as well. It's, it's um, the use of technology to interpret and to understand it and how that actually is incredibly artistic. It was brilliant seeing that little bit about um, uh, how you use light and colors. This is art using technology. Anyway, um, where was I? Yes, <laughs> I want to uh, discuss and I'll, I'll, I'll turn off my video because me waving my hands about will just be appallingly um, disruptive. Um, I want to discuss and present innovation. And now it's important to point out that innovation in the realm of 3D, 2.5, ah, we'll just call it 3D survey. 3D survey and visualization is not all about exactly what's been said, automated flight paths, single click rectifications, creating the um, uh, default from Agisoft to get your standard shading uh, out of um, your GIS program. It is so much more than that. So myself in my guise of Skyscape survey, decided to uh, look at my own personal workflow, one that combines our, a range of techniques and interpretations based upon, as been said before, the requirements of the particular site. And that, that's key to it. So that involves research and a bit of groundwork. And in my case, I actually fly manually. Um, I capture the images with the aid of a, a fabulous ground observer for safety purposes. But also most importantly, it allows me to discuss elements of the site with another person when we're, when we're actually there. And I'm also lucky to be that holy trinity of uh, a flyboy photographer and an archaeologist who has been working in uh, a topographic survey for decades. And I've been an illustrator. So I get to do all these things. I get to oversee all the key elements of this process. So rather than the process being cut up into separate packages for the uh, separate individuals, I take it right from the start which is usually climbing a bloody high hill, thank you, Matt, um, right to uh, the completion of, of the, the final package. Key to any project that I undertake, apart from, as I say, it seeming to be on the top of a very large bloody hill, is understanding the subtle balance, that, that subtle balance and acceptance between can you achieve and what you can achieve and very, very importantly, why you are trying to achieve that as well. So standard approaches, as Graham said, do not create innovation. They just create stagnation, repetitive, bland outcomes, which I'm sure nobody here would uh, ag agree with. So when I'm looking at a site, I mean, take this uh, beautiful sunset on over Ben Nevis. Now, to create this view of a fort in its setting, you've got to think ahead. You've got to plan ahead. You've got to have the right weather. You've got to be there at the right time. Very enjoyable it was too. This is what I see as innovative thought. So it's not just the technical know-how. It is innovation of artistic thought. 
Where the site is, as we all are aware, is as important as the site itself. And so therefore try to capture that genius loci, the, the prevailing character or atmosphere of a place is as much part of my flight plan as it is capturing the site data. I like to get to know a site, get to, to view it, to play with the, the ideas and the image scapes that can be created. And I always keep a spare battery in my pocket, both to keep it warm uh, so that it actually works, but also that I, once I actually realize what's going to be a good shot, what's going to best display the site, um, I've got a spare battery there to, to uh, get up there and fly. Now, this can also mean tramping to another bloody hill um, and flying from there. So it does keep me healthy. Doesn't mean, though, uh, that the product of low altitude aerial survey need be so creative as to be technically useless. You, you can't create until you've actually examined the results and then you've discussed them and you've understood the site. Then you can add that element of artistic interpretation. It's all about trying to convey and communicate. So here, um, the vitrified fort uh, at Dungeardal, recorded complete with orthographic images, geo-referenced GIS plots, all done according to the requirements, data standards. Though I have to say that my ortho image uh, does have a sense of drama about it. The contour plan, however, is enhanced with colors which are specific to this site. They visually hint at fires and, and burning stones streaming down the slopes from the rampart circuit. It's a simple but effective process. And why none of my reports, uh, and it uh, sounds like Graham as well, don't have a standard hill fort color scheme button. They're built to fit the site and the project. And uh, when I'm doing it for Matt, usually it comes back going, can we have that, but a slightly more caramel um, around about the 100 meter contour line, which is fine. So being creative, though, doesn't mean that you have to wander far from academic and professional data provision. Every tool should be used to enhance that experience where it is useful. So to immerse the viewer, the reader in the site landscape project is incredibly important. In this case, it's a proof of concept visualization of heritage sites in Emirate of uh, Ras al Khaimah. Sites can be viewed in the context of the location uh, based on LIDAR data and uh, a low altitude survey, but add in the element of sound and you're drawn into the model as a reality. But you can also view records and reports and site data just like a standard SMR. So this is about looking at what you capture, what it can be used for, and then what you can use it for. Uh, I'm going to have to say that one of my favorite proponents of this principle is Kieran Baxter. Look at his um, uh, Jarlshof video on Vimeo. It is absolutely immersive. It's engaging to the viewer and it provides everything that you want as well, whether you're just a, a, a member of the public um, or a researcher. Firing through, though, um, in relation to the complement complementary aspects of this process for myself, Dunmore uh, near Calendar is a great example. So where the Calendar Landscape Partnership, they were provided with a range of activities and visualizations and uh, myself uh, and Hannah also went on to the site uh, to do interpretation training about how you look at the landscape. Um, we had a look at how aerial works and how, and this is the important bit, how to interpret it with that degree of caution. So remember that, uh, as with anything, it's difficult to be certain of anything purely on topographic data alone, but it's still possible to discover potential. From the joy of, and uh, I wish I'd invented this term, micro contours. Yes, micro contours. In this case, we located the routes and tracks up to the site and also three possible hut platforms. We, were, we spent that fabulous sunny day on site with a local group and examining what we had. We, we had the maps and the model views with us. And I just heard uh, the other day, uh, thank you, AOC. Um, you were excavating up there and what we thought were hut platforms turned out to be 
Yay, hot platforms with a gorgeous square hearth in the middle of one and uh, an even more gorgeous shield bangle. So it's, it's gathering all these uh, bits and pieces together, um, taking and layering data to make it work. And then I'm afraid having a look and, and using the archaeologist's eye to interpret. So um, innovation. Again, I've actually, this is something that recently uh, hit me. It's meant that I had to embrace all the new technologies at, the, at my disposal, like Zoom and Sketchfab, which I've been, I've been loving. Uh, in this case, however, this is the, the gorgeous little castle, uh, Garton Castle in East Lothian. During COVID, it was actually very, very difficult to get everybody together. The client was in London, um, the architect couldn't be there. You know, so uh, with this model, we had discussions and communications with heritage bodies, with the client uh, and the architect, which were significantly enhanced because we're all able to use the same model, rotate it, view it from different angles. And uh, I'll just show you the detail of this model is uh, that little red square, which has hopefully appeared. I'll zoom into it. And there we have the unprecedented detail that we can zoom into a specific part of the model and discuss uh, a bit. All the work that we did was carried out remotely. And not only um, this, but it was part of the site archive as well as a tool for project management. A print of this, by the way, is going to be gifted to the client because um, they actually said that they want it. Uh, so now I actually suspect this has become art and not just a project management tool. Um, copies of this are available for 10.99 on the, the Badger site. So is it art? Is it art? Well, to be honest, all visualizations and illustration uh, are a form of art. It is conveying in a graphic form a concept. And although you're also at the same time providing a, a structured survey data set, the simple use of colors and framing can lift a standard contour plan and make it, well, both easily readable and hopefully aesthetically appealing. Um, here we've got the Scottish Broch uh, in, in Eden's Hall in the sky. I'm, I'm actually getting to think, I wonder how many people have done a three-dimensional model or 2.5-dimensional models of Eden's Hall Broch. It seems that um, there's a queue of archaeologists going to this place. <clears throat> Colour, again, of course, uh, plays a vital role in highlighting interpretations. And in this 2D interpretation of uh, the, the 3D data, using red for vitrified ramparts, blue for water features, green for turf banks, it's a very simple form here at uh, Knock Farrell up near Dingwall. So it's blending the survey with the, the aerial image as well to place that data into a real recognizable landscape, not just plopped there onto the page. In many cases, um, the, the material I'm asked to create is taken way beyond what I am capable of. Uh, in fact, most of the things I do, uh, there are so many more people who are much better at it than me. Uh, but I, I do love poodling along, um, trying to be innovative. So this site here in Glen Tress overlooks the Tweed Valley. Um, you got to get there very early in the morning, way too early in the morning, if I remember right, sort of tramping up a hill um, in, the, in the dark before the, the sun comes up. This was, um, and I'm glad you mentioned palisaded enclosures, had to get there really early to get that sharp shadow to pick out the palisaded enclosure and then produce a selection of views which allowed the fabulous um, uh, reconstruction artist uh, Chris Mitchell to create that uh, interpretation of, of the site as it moves from being a palisaded enclosure to this um, uh, banked enclosure. But here, as Graham was saying, the, the palisade, um, but it was about five, 10 centimeters deep maximum. And so you really had to sort of mix it up to get the micro contours to be able to actually see these things, plus merge that along with your visual data so that you can actually produce a model and an interpretation model, which could be used by um, 
the the, uh, the reconstruction artist. If you would like to see some other amazing reconstruction, Bob Marshall has done a fabulous reconstruction of Dunna Lamb as well. It's worth them um, looking about on, on video. Anyway, I'm going to just whiz through other studies. And it's again, it comes back to, to lighting and colour. It, it's all about what looks visually appealing and what works to actually be able to interpret the data as well. So back to Dunmore, and I, I went for this sort of um, muted greens because it, it did, uh, for some reason, it really worked in highlighting the, uh, the technical term lumps and bumps, as well as the, the contours, which are, at, uh, if I remember rightly on this one, I, I did a selection, these are 10 centimeter contours. But for some reason it works, you, you get that idea of the dramatic slope down to the right, the, the rocky cliffs, as well as being able to understand and visualize the site itself. Um, this is, I can't decide whether I should tell anyone, secret location. I know that I <laughs> several of you are already know where that is. Um, it's a new exciting rock art site or extension, I should say, extension of a rock art site. But for me, as a, a person who I, I understood uh, archaeoastronomy, it was, it was important not just to create a base plan for the, the higher resolution imaging techniques, but to aid the visualization of the site in the landscape. Uh, as it's clear that what you see from the site is as important as what you see at the site. Um, the LIDAR data annoyingly stopped around about 100 meters to the north of here. However, I not only created this um, uh, topographic uh, uh, model of the site, but I also did a whole pile of 180 degree and uh, spherical panoramas, which um, really do your head in, uh, unless you actually look at them in the correct viewer. But these will aid the archaeoastronomical um, visual aspect of uh, understanding and interpreting the site. And I have to say my current favorite, uh, and I suppose that's only because I, I've just done this one, is Cardrona. Um, Castle now, uh, fort there, a site completely surrounded densely by forests. Sorry, Matt, but these damn trees get in the way of the interpretation of the site. It's difficult to see and how it connects to the landscape. So, I created this image to kind of sum up what I was trying to achieve or being pushed beyond in, in many cases, what I think I can achieve. Here you see the site where the tree lines are dragged down so you can see the skyline, but I thought, I'm not gonna do it flat. I'm not gonna do it as it is. I'll use a cylindrical projection on it to create a sort of drama to the image with lowering clouds and the, the valley side surrounding it, curving up, drawing your eye in to the place and seeing the site at the center of a prehistoric, and I'm gonna throw this word in, timescape, why not? So it's manipulating. Um, this is not a traditional archeological image, but in a way it works as a, as a means to interpret and understand the site as you should. By the way, that is a later sheep enclosure. And uh, yeah, I swear to God, you don't really want to get me started on sheep enclosures in that area or uh, I'll be here all day. So I'm gonna, um, I'm not unsure myself actually if I've added anything to all the amazing innovations uh, that I've, I've been listening to so far, but I hope I've conveyed a concept of non-standard, of non-linear workflows. The importance of combining the hard data with the inter artistic interpretation of looking at the possible as well as what's required. It, I think that's the big call that's going out just now, that we should uh, try and understand what we're doing with this new technologies and not just let it stagnate into the default position. It's about innovation of visualization. It's taking the mundane contour survey and creating illustrations and interactive models that explain and open up possibilities of interpretation and discovery, like the Edinburgh Castle one, um, which I wandered around and found uh, somebody had dropped a cigarette um, uh, on the ground just inside the Half Moon Battery, if you would like to go and pick it up. It's 
over and above, beyond, in fact, the, the, the technologies and the, the capabilities of low altitude landscape survey. It's the artistic eye. That's, that's a key element to it, the artistic eye to allow you to interpret, the archaeologist's eye to understand what it is you're seeing and the potential to layer the data and to create art as an illustration that can inform and remain archaeologically grounded while the ideas, and I dare say it, take flight. So I'm going to duck out now. Um, and, uh, how many more flight-based puns are there? Well, the sky is... <laughs> stop, <like> stop! Only <laughs> your imagination. Yes, there you go. Thank you very much, David. That was excellent. I stop, um, stop doing this now. Just waving your hands around. Um, I, I don't think we can really adopt a sta standardization equals stagnation uh, <laughs> uh, motto. There's sometimes standardization is good, but uh, what I what I picked from from that picked up from that was very much about um, the requirements of the individual site and, and and thinking it through. And I thought that was there were lots of really good examples of that that sort of iterative process of think, thinking through how you're going to survey and then and then uh, uh, portray the site. Um, and I really loved the, the 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 castle site where you'd used it as a project management tool uh, with, to, to to host discussions with clients and um, and uh, and uh, the the heritage bodies. So so really really good. Thank you very much. Um, I have we got any questions in the we uh, in the box? I don't think so. I think we've 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 spent our time plugging our various uh, various products and blogs and and good old Bob. Um, so I think at that point. We're, I think we're going to we're, we're going to move on if that's all right. Keep keep questions till the end. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, it's uh, Wukash Banashek of Historic Environment Scotland who is talking on field observation, uh, 3D modelling, and the enhancement of illustrative techniques. Uh, over to you, Wukash. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure to be here with you, and it's really nice to hear uh, my name uh, pronounced uh, uh, like a like an almost like a Polish native speaker. But of course, for those of you who do not have as strong uh, connection to Poland as Matt, it's simply Luk Lucas. Uh, it's really nice to be here here in late in the day, so I can do one directional uh, references to uh, the speakers and their presentations, so and they cannot uh, defend them themselves at this at this point of time uh, but of course we were going to have a discussion later today um, luckily Lynn uh, has covered uh, uh, most of the corporate uh, stuff uh, and corporate introductions in her presentations um, uh, because together with Ali, uh, who couldn't be here with us, we are also uh, members of the Historic Environment Scotland, and we work for the archaeological survey team. And one thing to add to Lynn's presentation is uh, uh, that as, as an HES, we also survey and record our archaeological and architectural um, sites uh, all over Scotland, out with the uh, properties and care, and out with uh, scheduled monuments even. And uh, this presentation will be uh, focused primarily on those sites that are not uh, in our uh, under our protect, uh, protection. Um, right. Um, so the use of 3D data, and as it has been um, uh, presented uh, in the earlier present presentations, is widespread. Uh, but I will focus on the uh, uh, on archaeological survey and how this is used at various levels of our survey. And my fo primary focus will lay in the novel method uh, which we use to incorporate the depiction of the natural topography in the relationship to the archaeological features. Um, something that, uh, as you will see, um, required uh, enhancement. So uh, underlying uh, condition is that the field observation and discussion amongst the survey team on the on the ground or in the office is crucial to the interpretation of any monument and whether this is archaeological uh, features or the topography itself uh, we need to be uh, uh, we need to ensure that we there is a discussion there are uh, different uh, voices heard 
and uh, used to interpret archaeology and topography. And uh, this is this is an underlying factor here, although I won't uh, um, uh, refer to it again. Um, the Erdvog survey has a long tradition in Scottish and British archaeology, in fact, and uh, this um, uh, survey this example of Norman's law uh, uh, of fort in five uh, it comes from the early 20s uh, of the previous century and we can see here how uh, the investigators looked at the site and here's a plan that was produced uh, uh, as a result of the survey and natural slope hashes were used to, to convey the topography of the monument. As we can see, the, uh, the extent of the survey was quite limited, so the, the hashes um, do not end relatively uh, in a short distance from the from the monument, so we do not really know, we do not really appreciate the landscape context that uh, is there uh, in the hill. And of course, with the change in archaeological scope, uh, and in this case, uh, we are still looking at Norman's law, uh, we see more hot circles and banks and uh, other features added to the plan. Um, it really didn't change how the topography has been presented and has been um, uh, mapped. So the, top, the natural topography has often been the poor cousin in site plans and uh, it's depending on the eye of the illustrator and a relatively small number of measured points as we can see here uh, only a few points were, were measured and then a, a, a site plan was created. And the change in surveying methods in instruments, however, um, in fact, in the Royal Commission or uh, HES, has not changed the way in Hasher uh, drawing, apart from the style, adding uh, dif different style and uh, changing the color from uh, black to brownish. But still, uh, the approach has been to, to use the natural hashes to depict uh, the topography. And of course, hashes, as, as Graham has uh, already mentioned, have a long history and been used by early modern map makers uh, to, to uh, present the, the differences in topography. Uh, but already in early 19th century, contour contours became to be present in uh, maps of, of the UK or in Scotland, uh, with the top left uh, example being the first edition map where we, where we can see that 12 and a half uh, hundred um, uh, feet contour. But uh, contours were as uh, were treated as an addition to hashes depicting uh, the, the natural topography of the East Lomond Hill, as we can see it here. Finally, in the mid 20th century, the contour maps has become a, a real thing and uh, widespread uh, in, in uh, OS mapping and other uh, map makers. Uh, here we can see the, the same hill with all the contours are, uh, around it and the uh, pickled line used to depict the, the, the uh, archaeological artworks. So this is one one thread I will I will I will build my presentation on. And the second one is that at the same time we uh, with the artwork survey, the aerial survey has uh, a long tradition in the Royal Commission or uh, currently in HES, uh, using both uh, uh, light wind aircrafts, uh, producing uh, oblique photographs, but also using vertical uh, imagery uh, collected by RAF or uh, other organizations, but also re most, most recently by UAVs. And this data set that is produced through aerial survey has been widely used in site detection, monitoring and illustration of different sites uh, across Scotland. And recently with the development of uh, structure from motion and uh, easily uh, uh, available data, uh, we can uh, produce 3D models uh, uh, from aerial survey images and to look into this 3D uh, dimension as well. So 
what I'm going to talk right now is how we use this data that can be produced uh, from structure, uh, from structure from motion approach, or in fact, any 3D data um, in earthwork survey. And I will be primarily using the East Lomont example here. And such data uh, can, as, as Graham uh, has uh, presented, can be used in 2D to and a half D and can improve uh, our understanding of the site, both in the office and on the ground, if uh, uh, there is, we, we got the capacity to take it with us on a big screen and uh, where we find a place where it's not much sunshine, of course. Uh, but while it is, informative and it can help us to improve our understanding of the earthworks and the topography, the uh, GPS survey is still um, at the forefront of uh, measuring si uh, measuring archaeological features. And for instance, at East Lomont, we measured over 1400 uh, points uh, just to produce a site plan. So this information is, is thereafter uh, processed, uh, uh, undis, uh, undis, uh, interpreted, and site plans are drawn. With every plan, we add information, we add different layers of information to a final product, which we, of course, uh, thereafter archive uh, in, in Canmore or uh, the National Record. And uh, here we, we are looking at the North Berwick Law example, where we got all the man-made features added uh, to the plan and which can be supplemented uh, by a slope visualization which we can see here and what we've done for traprain law or not Berwick law is a hyperlinked and layer pad pdf which is uploaded to the uh, database national database where we can explore the visualizations on our own of course in a 2d environment rather than two and a half or 3D, because this our primary aim is to present this data in a way that it has been presented before, but also this is the data that can be easily used, printed out, used on site, used by policymakers, by land managers, by other archaeologists uh, uh, um, uh, trying uh, doing the investigations on site. But even though the structure from, from motion approach was used for uh, North Berwick, we created what we can call, call the tree edge data for natural topography. So it's packed with hasher, natural hashes. So the 3D data informed the, uh, the illustrator where the break of slope is, where the change in director, uh, direction of slope is. And we can see this massive, massive amount of hashes, way more detailed than it was you it was presented uh, in in the earlier examples but of course there are some uh, problems with hash drawings and hashes in, in general which i'll try to address here and one of the, one of the problems with in presenting both the hash drawings uh we were there uh, in which we've got an artificial break of slope, artificial terrace introduced to data wherever the change in direction uh, of, of slope or the angle of the slope happens, there we got this uh, linear um, blank spaces, which the reader of, of such data can misunderstood as flat areas. Or we can see I don't know if, if, if my mic, mouse cursor is visible um, uh, in here, a feature that has not been mapped whatsoever, uh, which is clearly man-made, but it's it's modern, it's, it's, it's a modern footpath. So it's no, of no relevance of, of, uh, for archeological investigations, but it immediately draws the attention of a reader who might uh, uh, say that, oh, hey, those guys uh, uh, didn't see this feature, they didn't include that. If we wanted to include all, all features like that, uh, a hasher plan, hasher drawing will be, will be packed with ship uh, paths, with uh, minor footpaths. So it would actually obscure the visibility of archeological uh, information and archeological features. So this, this were the problems that we, uh, we, uh, we've been uh, trying to tackle here. And uh, 
the solution what, which we uh, are proposing and which we uh, came with, uh, to is the use of 3D data um, to improve our understanding of the topography. So not only visualizing it, not only visualizing the, um, uh, producing the visual, visualizations which, we, which are nice, which are artistic, which are uh, easy to read, but also that point us to certain and main components of the landscape, whether, uh, and I'm talking here about top, the natural topography rather than earthworks. Um, so here are four examples of uh, uh, products that actually help us to understand more the topography of the of the East Lomond Hill. So on the on the top in the top left corner we've got the height model, of course, just a, a simple height model. So we can see clearly which features are higher or lower. Uh, on the top right corner, we've got, in the top right corner, we got the slope visualization. So we get the angle uh, of the slope. Bottom left is the roughness of, of the terrain and the local relief model, which can uh, show us clearly the difference between concave and convex features and the aspect of the slope on, in the bottom right corner. So the orientation of, of the uh, flanks of the hill. And one of my uh, uh, favorite is uh, this this image uh, which we produced, which is actually not a raster. It's it's a vector representation of uh, of a slope, in which, as you can see it here in more detail, every single cell cell of a raster was transposed into a vector fit, vector value, and. Uh, uh, the size and orientation and color of the arrow tells us which way the slope descends and how steep the descent is, how steep is the slope in this certain raster point, uh, raster uh, cell. So the, all of this can be used by the illustrator to produce better and better and more consistent uh, uh, topographic uh, illustration which can be, of, uh, of course, pretty complex, as we can see it here. So we get masses of masses of uh, uh, different uh, hashers. Some of them uh, are very short, some of them are much longer. But again, there are unresolved issues. We do not, see, we do not actually know high, what is the high difference between the top enclosure and the tracks that are uh, below the hill, because the hashers don't tell us that. We see loads of this artificial terracing here, which is simply the break of slope rather than a, a flat area uh, around the hill. So although this improved the consistency, it still takes a lot of time for the illustrator to produce such an image. So one of the solutions is automated. And using JS, we can write a script which will uh, pick up all the uh, outcrop or produce uh, contours for uh, for uh, uh, for our hill uh, in no time. I mean, the processing of this data took about half an hour instead of seven days of Ali's time in uh, uh, drawing hashers around the hill. Of course, this is not publication ready data, but it it, it uh, uh, the advantages advantage of this uh, product is that there is no artificial breaks of slope. Of course, some of course some hashes do cross, which shouldn't be there in alcohol illustration. But still, we can see the outcrop uh, uh, based on the slope and roughness data. We can see the the slopes. However, we weren't happy with with using hashers anymore. So, because we do have access to this three D data. Um, which um, and can enhance the, uh, the uh, presentation of site in a, in a, a broader context, uh, we wanted to have some uh, additional uh, back, uh, background to our archaeological interpretation. So we decided to, to, uh, to go for two additional layers of data. One of them is the, the contours, which are at the bottom of, the, of this slide here. So the contours help us to, uh, to present the high difference between different uh, uh, parts of the landscape. So we can clearly see which uh, uh, features are uh, located higher and which are below. And the other thing is, is the slope. The slope visualization is really important. It can help us 
uh, to see which uh, parts of the hills are steep and which are more flat. However, the problem which, we, which, I, which I discussed already at Norberwick is that too much data makes the reader um, feel uncomfortable and they look at, at features that are non-archaeological or archaeological irrelevant and uh, focus their attention to this kind of uh, uh, features. So instead of presenting the um, uh, slope visualization as it is, so stretch uh, from zero to 90 degrees uh, in a color pal palette, we decided to uh, present the slope in three, in three classes, which we can see in the top right corner. So uh, relatively flat areas, moderate uh, slope, and much steeper slopes. And for this, uh, uh, for this um, uh, steepness of slope uh, visualizations, we use three categories. And one of uh, it's between 0 and 15 degrees, 15 and 30 degrees, and over 30 degrees. And why is that? Uh, we, uh, as humans, read slopes differently. And it's almost like uh, anglers who, who try to persuade you that the fish that they've caught is massive, almost the size of their, uh, the width of their body, while, while in fact it's only 15 centimeters. By putting the fish closer to the, closer to the camera than their head or their body is, creating this uh, impression. And we, uh, there is, there is, there is uh, quite a significant research on how people read and behave about slopes. Whenever we, we see a steep slope, we think that it's 45 degrees or even 60 degrees, while in fact it's less than 15. So we tend to exaggerate slopes. We tend to um, uh, say that the, that the hills were really steep if we felt uncomfortable climbing there. And the research shows that uh, generally as humans, we tend to say that the area between, of the, the, the steepness between zero and 15 degrees is considered by most of us as relatively flat. We can walk, uh, walk on it relatively easy. It doesn't cost us a lot of effort and uh, we tend to call it as a flat area. And uh, the slopes between 15 and 30 degrees uh, are demanding, uh, but are, still um, within the reach of most of us. Uh, so we can climb them easily. Uh, this is small as how, uh, how steep the steps in our staircases are. So we can um, uh, walk along those steps uh, relatively uh, easily. And over 30 degrees uh, uh, slopes are rather difficult. We start to zigzag uh, while traversing them. We try. We start to avoid them if we can. And uh, of course, the border between those categories is not sharp, and it will be different for different uh, people, uh, how, depending how fit they are and how they perceive, perceive slopes. But uh, we can still use these categories to clearly define the flat areas on East Lomond Hill all the enclosed uh, uh, areas on the hill and how the construction of uh, earthworks and banks actually created more and more terracing. So to, and together with contours, uh, we can see the different difference in height and in steepness of slope. So, and of course, this illustration is, is a huge improvement comparing to the early 20th, uh, early 20s of the of the 20th century plan uh, visible here on the left. And it's not only in terms of uh, broadening the scope in our, of archaeological survey, but also in showing the presence of the site in a wider landscape. And we've been using this approach uh, in different sites, not only on, on hill forts. Uh, we've used it for uh, a few sites on Aran. Um, uh, this includes farmsteads, forts, uh, the, the courses in Torbeck, but also slightly bigger landscape like uh, the Baritas mines in, in Glen Sanox. And what is important here, immediately when, you, when we look at these three different uh, um, maps, although they've been created at, in different scale 
and the contours, the difference between us individual contours is uh, uh, is there. So uh, um, there, the, co the contours on, in the left image are about 10 meters, uh, two meters, and the contours on the right images are about one meters, one meter. We can still compare how flat or how steep the area is regardless of contour information. So we don't have to go into uh, the values of contours to understand that this is more or less a flat part of the landscape that has been used or uh, more steep uh, in, in the case of uh, the uh, Dun Fion fort in the top right corner. So we've been rolled. We've rolled out this uh, uh, to other uh, sites, and this is the way forward for our site plans and our uh, artwork surveys. Um, so to sum up, the treaty data embed is we've embedded the treaty data in the artwork survey, and, and we are using it at various levels, from uh, informing the the surveyors on ground up to the presentation. And this helps us to understand the topography, the natural topography of any site much better, because we are not only visualizing, visualizing the data, but we are looking into specific parameters of the landscape by using those um, uh, products that I've uh, discussed. And the natural topography is presented in relationship to the archaeological features, so we can clearly see the difference between the relatively flat areas and the steeper slopes. At the same time, we are using uh, the established techniques and conventions to present archaeological features. So it's it's speckled line still, and uh, because we still feel that this is the uh, what people uh, can easily read and what and it has a great potential of showing the um, uh, relationship between different features. Uh, but uh, our next steps uh, will look into how we can change this as well. And thank you for the day. Thank you very much, Wukash. That was uh, excellent. Uh, a fascinating uh, deep dive insight behind how you are now creating these uh, large scale uh, model well, uh, survey plans. I think that, that was really, really good. I'd, I hadn't actually clocked the reason behind the, the different steepnesses of slope that you've chosen to, to, to use. Uh, I think that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat immediately. Uh, so I think we'll hold that back. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna move straight on to Dr. Hugo Anderson Weimark, uh, who is going to be talking on capturing the moment uh, using photogrammetry for public engagement on archeological excavations. Uh, thank you, Wukash, and on to Hugo. Um, yeah, I really have to thank Matt for inviting me to talk at this event uh, today and champion the role of photogrammetry in public dissemination. Um, it's something which I suppose I, I had to think back about sort of uh, about when I started started uh, doing this. And uh, so this has been a real opportunity to think back over some of the projects and some of the approaches that um, that, that, are, that I've used and that you can be used in um, using photogrammetry, any form of 3D modeling really, in disseminating the uh, story of your archaeological sites to the public. So um, I wanted to think back right to when I first got an interest in photogrammetry, and actually it came out of um, the laser scan project, which was uh, uh, undertaken at Stonehenge. And this was a, an analysis of, of laser scan data, which produced these wonderful um, images of, uh, of the carvings on the stones, working with Marcus Abbott, uh, incredibly talented to bring out a lot of this detail. Um, but at the same time, we're interested in a lot of the um, later carvings, um, initials, names and that on the stones. And some of those hadn't been picked up so well in the, the laser scan data. So we, were, we experimented with uh, using um, photogrammetry to try and pick out some of those details and visualize um, some of those uh, some of those carvings in more detail, and yeah, Mark has really demonstrated to me the real value of of, of that technique, um, and um, as a result, at the same time, I then began using photogrammetry um, at the Nest of Brodka, where I was working in the summer, excavating late Neolithic structures um, such as this one uh, on the Nest of Brodka. You can see the walls of the structure coming round, the two halves in the middle, 
two doorways into it. It's, it was a very effective technique, both for recording the site, um, but obviously the range of techniques we were using mostly in the excavation were relatively standard techniques of planning to get that in, you know, the interpretive element, but also laser scanning as well. Photogrammetry really provided a, uh, a very rapid technique of, of acquiring um, views of the excavation at very distinct stages through it. Obviously, excavations change on a daily basis. Deposits come and go very rapidly. Um, and this was proving a very, very valuable technique for capturing that moment. So this was back in 2012. Um, and we were at the time, as soon as we sort of started uh, looking at, um, looking at uh, these models, we realized the massive potential for sharing with these with the public and telling the story of the site. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Nessa Brodka, it's largely funded by uh, public donations. Uh, there's a huge number of visitors to the excavation every year. Um, many contribute to uh, contribute to effectively the excavation fund, and there's big fundraising beyond it. Um, and as part of this, there's always been a very um, big outreach program, as it were, in terms of presenting the archaeology to the public through a daily blog during the excavation season. Um, and uh, we really wanted this to be part of it. Now, the problem was back at that time, how we shared these models. Obviously, you, there wasn't, you know, web viewers didn't really uh, display models. Uh, you could create files, obviously, that people could download if they downloaded a 3D viewer. You could put out 3D PDFs. You could animate it and put it up as a video on YouTube. But none were truly sort of satisfactory ways of um, presenting, presenting this information. So that was... That was a that was a challenge and something we we experimented with over time. Now that certainly didn't stop us using photogrammetry more and more on the site and sort of so by 2015 we were producing very big extensive models of the excavation, um, and you know again really really getting the benefit of being able to see that overview of the site. Um, and I just I just put in a brief note here. Many people think that I make these models with uh, drones or something else. I am very low tech in my 3D model making. I prefer a camera on a pole because I like the control you have of going across the surface and on particularly complex sites like the Ness of Brodka, being able to get the photos at precisely the right angles and positions to pick up that detail and get that get the you know into every nook and cranny across the site. I find that more effective than having a sort of regular sort of survey pattern as it were. So anyway, that, that's, that's just a sideline here. But the key thing that changed in 2015 was that um, I joined Sketchfab. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, we, we found obviously a little bit late, Sketchfab had been around by a few years for a few years for then, but um, obviously it was, it became our key way of sharing the models uh, of, of the site. Um, and we realized instantly that there was a massive public appetite for these models too. So within uh, weeks of releasing this model on Sketchfab of the entire site, it had more than 30,000 views. And, you know, we were getting great feedback about, about the results. So we had a way of putting it out there. And ever since 2015, uh, 3D modeling has really been a very important part of the outreach of Vanessa Brodka and the models put out on a regular basis, both uh, complete models of the site, models of individual buildings, models of parts of structures that are of interest and have the detail and sometimes individual archaeological finds. Um, so, uh, you know, artifacts and that as well. Now, with the, uh, you know, it, the key part of this is that we, what we could do is produce these models during the excavation. So we could capture them the same, you know, on, a, on an afternoon, process them overnight and have something ready to put out it to the public the following day with the next blog. So it's making it current, keeping it live, keeping it fresh. Um, and it is constantly, it is obviously constantly changing because of the nature of the excavation. And obviously it's worth mentioning with these sort of 3D models, it's a big excavation. Even if you visit the site, you don't get to stand in the middle of the structures. 
Whereas obviously if you've got a VR headset, you can drop yourself into the buildings and really appreciate the architecture of that site. The, you know, the upstanding nature of so many of the walls on, on this particular excavation. So having worked on the Ness, um, I worked with many other colleagues and other excavations in Orkney um, to capture their excavations at various different stages. This is the Cairns Brock on South Ronaldsey in uh, 2017. And again, it's, it's great to look back on these models because you realize how fleeting so many archeological excavations are. Um, this showing the, 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 the occupation deposits within the monument, uh, the orthostats dividing this internal area into, into sort of different spaces. Um, the excavation has progressed on. Most of those deposits have gone now. Um, and so again, it's that, it's that capturing a moment and being able to provide that detailed tour of the site through annotations. So in this particular model, it was talking about those deposits in the floor, talking about the souterrain that was later, later reused the entrance, and then also some detail on the metal working area down this slope. That snapshot of being able to give a little guided tour to a site that not everyone by any means could visit because it's only open for a few weeks a year. And as well, it's obviously uh, uh, very remote to some people who have an interest in this archeology span as well. So um, uh, another great way of, of, of capturing that at that moment. Um, and just another quick example here from Sandy in Orkney. Uh, this is a, a Neolithic house, if you can see the the walls coming round and a half here, um, some occupation deposits down this end, and a, a, a pit with uh, 19th century whale burials uh, cutting through the whole lot. But a 3D model in this context really captures the vulnerability of the archaeology on this site. You can see it is on a beach. It is washed by the tide twice a day. The sand dune that you can see in this image has subsequently been entirely eroded away. Um, so in this case, it really represents the vulnerability of this excavation, the fragility of that archaeology and um, how easily it is lost um, to, to, to climate change, to sea level change, to increased storminess and the like. So again, something that, um, that really visually expresses the vulnerability of archaeology in certain parts of Orkney. Now, um, I just want to sort of step a bit sideways in some ways and talk about a project I was involved with with uh, Historic Environment Scotland um, that was with their interpretation team looking at uh, revising some of the dated notice boards, uh, dis display panels that were on various tombs around Orkney. And this came out of an experiment I was really interested in trying to capture very complex archaeological uh, sites, in this case, tombs which are connected obviously by a very narrow passage into a large dark space in the middle um, and then obviously the mound and the exterior and actually by experimenting with this it, it revealed the real potential of of showing how the mound relates to the uh, structure inside um, and you know understanding how better the earthwork relates to the actual archaeology within and also, if you look to the left hand side, um, that ability to have a tour of the interior of this structure as well. Now, um, in the end, this turned into a project to help uh, with the interpretation panels on this site um, and, and ended up recording all of the upstanding um, tombs uh, which needed new display panels. Um, but the 3D models were really a benefit of the outcome of this in terms that these are available on Sketchfab and you can, you know, it really opens access to these monuments. The passages, you need to be, you know, they're not wheelchair accessible. In fact, you need to be very good at going in on your hands and knees to get into these monuments. They're dark, they're quite claustrophobic. So, you know, they're not for everyone, but we can at least open those spaces up through, um, through 3D, both whether it's on, you know, Sketchfab, it's just a, something on the screen, or through a VR headset, so you actually get the experience of being within that space. Um, 
And actually, it's not the same as going in the monument by any means, because obviously you can see from this uh, model here, the tomb is lit up. But it's actually, that's a, a relic of the, the, the photogrammetry itself and lighting that space up as, as it was photographed. So it's pitch black in reality, but it comes out as effectively a lit monument. But that allows you to appreciate the stonework in a different way to you would when you're actually in that monument. So this again, photogrammetry for me as an interpretation tool was very much the method of choice here. Uh, it's not necessarily a survey grade sort of model here. We're dealing with something that is very expedient in its image capture. So dealing with something usually between 1,200 and 2,500 images per model. And this was captured typically within half a day on site. So very rapid image capture across these sites across the exterior, obviously each one of these blue dots represents a point of image capture um, within the monument, obviously particularly challenging to operate in the, the small confines of a sort of side cell of a, a Neolithic chamber, but still just about doable. Um, and so a very expedient capture, very expedient processing to produce a model that effectively, in this case, its primary output was actually a sectional view that was then Bob Marshall popping up again in this one, um, transforming that into a sectional view of, uh, of the monument, um, which these images were then used on the display panels. And you know, a significant step away from using just plans and sections as you would have seen on the, the uh, original panels oh, back here. Oh. Um, another thing to note actually, actually is when you're doing cutaways of 3D models, um, uh, the 3D model, when it rotates, it's very easy to understand how, say, that solid structure sits within the, uh, the, the transparent mound. But as soon as you cut it away to make it a static thing, it becomes much more difficult to actually visualise that. So you do need to create a sort of effectively a solid section through these monuments. Um, so um, just stepping right up to this summer, um, because I, I, got to, I got to excavate this summer and that was fantastic. It was lovely to be back in the field again, um, back up in Orkney working with Professor Vicky Cummings from the University of Central Lancashire. And we were looking at um, the Tresnes Cairn in Orkney. And throughout this project, we've been um, using photogrammetry to, to make a record of the site from the very first moment uh, we got into the field. And we've put these models out through each and every season we've done since 2017. As you can see, this site is on the coast. It's, it's eroding archaeology again. About a third of the monument has dropped off the cliff already. It's in a very vulnerable location. And the 3D modelling, this one's cropped quite close, but we've kept in the beach in many of the models so you can actually appreciate the vulnerability again of that archaeology. This particular model, you can see the Bronze Age monument very clearly. It's a round cairn built over the Neolithic one, so you have to ignore the chamber in this model. Um, in, in this season's work, we extended the uh, excavation out to each side to actually look at the cairn. And so you can see with this particular model, the wonderful Bronze Age stonework all removed from the Neolithic monument and this wonderful wall built around the exterior of the monument. Um, again, it's a very visual way of displaying what, a, what an incredibly intact Neolithic monument, uh, near Bronze Age monument this is. Um, and so we, again, on Sketchfab, we were using these models to tell that story. And if we jump forward to the end of the excavation, you can see that Bronze Age monument has gone and we're revealing the rectangular Neolithic monument that lay underneath it. And you can appreciate the different phases of stonework within the construction of the monument, the entrance passage coming out the uh, side of the monument here facing east and obviously within the chamber here the stools that divided this up into a into a stalled cairn. Um, so uh, again a great way of just display talking about the stratigraphy, talking about the threats to the site and talking through the basic forms of these monuments uh, in a very public forum. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch as well on some of the work uh, we do at the museum with artefacts. It's obviously principally uh, my what I do most of the time. 
I'm out on site as a field archaeologist for some of it. Uh, but uh, most of the time we're dealing with artifacts which are obviously already in our collections. Um, and we are making sort of some headway in terms of digitizing some aspects of our collection from these carved stone balls where we have about 100 of those online now to our, to our Lewis chess pieces, which obviously have always been universally popular. Um, and in terms of actually, if you ever visit the Lewis chess pieces and you, you go into VR, I've had a little bit of fun and I've made them about eight foot tall. <laughs> so if you, if you go in, you don't, get the, you don't get the experience of one sitting in your hand. I decided that was too, too easy. So you get to see this wonderful chess piece stood in front of you. Um, but we've been using this a lot more um, photogrammetry in terms of uh, recording, in terms of work we do with treasure trove, where say metal detectorists find a hoard, leave it in situ and we excavate it. Um, this example here is the Borders Hoard, a Bronze Age metalwork hoard with a sword running through the middle uh, on top of uh, a Bronze Age horse harness. Um, and this model was put out with the press release about this discovery last summer. And actually, you can see with all the publicity it had in the national press, it received over 200,000 views very rapidly. Now, for us, the key benefit of this is you can see the annotations we've put on this giving a tour of that hoard, talking about the objects and the story, the significance of the deposition. That story is the one we want to tell. And obviously the press coverage, the press stories don't always tell the story you want to tell, but by linking into our model, we get to still keep that narrative against those objects. So that for us was a real benefit to, um, to having it attached to a 3D model. Now, finally here, I've put up a, couple of bits of Viking um, or Anglo-Saxon Viking metalwork for you from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the Galloway Horde. So you can see these wonderful items. They're currently on uh, display in Kukubri, um, but we've just had the exhibition of the Galloway Horde at the National Museum. Now, as part of this, these models formed part of that exhibition, um, along with several others, because We'd normally have touch screens in the, in the spaces where people could interact with these models, um, but that's not possible at present due to COVID restrictions. So instead, we use the QR codes, which seem to have become so popular again in lockdown, to actually um, have these connected to the model. So you could look at the actual object in the display cabinet and then open up the 3D model on your phone and you know look at it, take it away with you. And so what we we're finding that around five to 10% of visitors were actually looking at the 3D models of these objects on the phone. But we also had quite a lot of takeaway of these 3D models in that people were taking away and then sharing them outside as well. So a great way of disseminating um, these objects. And obviously you can tell, tell the stories in the, the, the descriptions in Sketchfab too. So um, yeah, a wonderful way of both promoting uh, promoting uh, the, the exhibition and being able to um, give a little bit more detail of these objects uh, to take away from the exhibition. So um, a little bit of innovation in terms of how they're used in displays there. Now I'm going to wrap up there, um, but uh, all of the models I featured in this talk are all publicly available. They're all on Sketchfab through various different accounts. And, um, and I just, yeah, I just, We'll leave it there because there is obviously so much 3D content and it is just a great way of getting it out to the public. You do often still have to promote through other channels in terms of Twitter and Facebook and whatever else to get people to view your Sketchfab models, but it's a great way of obviously um, displaying them. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there and back over to you, Matt. Thank you very much, Hugo. That was absolutely fantastic. Hypnotic, even. I think that it, what you've done there uh, is absolutely brilliant. And looking back, I, I thought very well titled, actually, capturing the moment, uh, whether it be uh, an, an, a, a moment within an excavation or like the, the Neolithic house on the beach, uh, a moment before it before it's washed away. Uh, that, that, that was, I thought, was really, really powerful. And again, actually, that, that fourth dimension has been running throughout our presentations uh, in terms of people uh, presenting uh, the, the, the time uh, it takes 
uh, or, or time in, in, in terms of condition monitoring, like, like Lim was talking about in, in Scarabray, uh, through to, all, all the way through to, 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 to the immediacy that you can, you can, you can produce a, a sketch fab, sketch fab model from. So I'd like to uh, thank all of our, um, presenters this afternoon. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, and I'm now going to uh, throw it open and, and hopefully the, the, the two uh, who left messages in the chat, uh, that was, uh, hang on, I'll try and go up. Uh, Jenny and then Joel uh, would like to put their hands up and ask their questions again, or I could read them out. But otherwise, we'll, we'll uh, uh, thank you all, and we'll open up for a, 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 genuine, a genuine discussion uh, with our innovators uh, and indeed creators. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>